But you might not see the beauty that's in front of your own face So let's go get a coffee from the shop for seven bucks If you're after contemplation, let me tell you you're in luck Cause you're at Contemplative Coffee Corner It's a place for deep discussion Too bad nothing rhymes with corner, that's right Grab your MacBook, bring a mug, and open mind Cause a little contemplation does a lot for humankind. Welcome back to Contemplative Coffee Corner. I'm Austin. This isn't coffee. And today's subject of contemplation is... Fame. fame. You know, I may not look it, but uh... I used to be famous once. But now isn't the time for such things. For now, let's focus on what fame is. What does it mean to have fame? Where can you get it from? What can fame do for you? To answer the first question, let's consult a graph that I hang above my bed and see every morning when I wake up. What you can clearly see here is a direct correlation between fame and personal value. When you're famous, people love you, and more importantly, you love yourself. Just... Just like... I used to. And now, allow me to take this opportunity to play for you a song I wrote about fame. The world is a deep, deep place, but you're just a f***ing loser if you aren't in first place. That's right. Grab a spotlight, bring a megaphone as well. If you're not the main attraction, then you're pretty much in hell. Let me tell ya. Oprah, Johnny Depp, Beyonce, Kenny G. If you're famous, then you matter. It's the only way to be. You're only worth as much as strangers think you are. You'll never amount to anything unless you are a star. Fun fact. I wrote that as a lullaby for my future son. And now, a story from my dark and brooding past. Like I said earlier, I was famous once. It was high school, junior year. I was in drama club, the birthplace of shining stars. I had heard that auditions were to be held for our fall musical, Murder at Café Noir, an interactive dinner theater murder mystery comedy extravaganza. A play that was so many things, and I wanted to be the star of all of it. The lead role was Richard Archer, a private detective. It was perfect. You see, I lived close enough to the high school that I could walk, but just far enough away that it took me maybe a collective half hour each day. Half an hour every day that I spent by myself. And what I do during that time is practice different voices, because I'm weird, and that's, uh, that's what I did for fun. You know, I'd try to do a Mickey Mouse. It didn't work out so well. Does it sound like the it sounds like the voice of a person who can do a really good Mickey Mouse. Um, but what I was really good at, or at least what 11th grade me thought I was uh, pretty slamming at, was my detective voice. I practiced it every day. And so when I heard that that was, uh, that was what was going to be our fall musical, a murder mystery with a detective in the lead role, I thought I was a shoo-in. Of course, I'd never been to serious auditions before, and I didn't know exactly what to expect. And you know, I say serious auditions, it's high, it's high school drama club, but that's pretty, that's pretty scary. At least it was for 11th grade me. So finally, auditions roll around, and I waltz into the auditorium all confident, and then as soon as I see everybody sitting down, waiting to be called to the stage, I uh, immediately lose all my confidence. It's gone. I'm shaking. I realize the gravity of my situation. I'm gonna have to audition, you know, in a role that I've never uh, seen before. I've never seen any of these lines before. And I have to, like, prance about on stage uh, in front of all these people. In front of a jury of my peers. That's no good at all. You know, that's what Drama Club's all about, but <laughs> it's scary. It's a terrifying thing. And, uh, one by one, we're called to the stage and uh, trying out different lines, trying out different roles, seeing who fits where. And finally, everybody's been called but me. I'm 
terrified. I don't want to go up there. But I slowly make my way, everybody's watching me. And as soon as I set foot on the cheap wood of our low-budget high school auditorium stage, I come alive. I'm no longer Austin Flory, easily intimidated high school student. I'm Richard Archer, private detective. And I'm running around the stage like I own the place. I'm throwing lines this way, throwing lines that way. Who you talking to? Who you think this is? Uh, you know, stuff like that. Those aren't, those aren't lines from the play. That's just me uh, being an ass here on camera. But, um, I felt great. I felt fantastic. I felt, uh, alive. And then as soon as it started, it, uh, ended. And auditions were over and we had to go home and wait for the final cast list to come out. And I have no idea what to expect. Eventually, I get a ring on my phone and, uh, well, you know, a text message beep, whatever. Close enough to a ring. And I look at it and, uh, I got the lead role. This was my chance. This, I thought, is how I'm gonna get famous. I'm gonna kill it in this, <laughs> uh, in this high school show as an 11th grader playing a private detective, and I'm gonna, you know, rocket my way to fame afterwards. This was all, you know, this all made perfect sense in my head back then. So I'm going to rehearsals almost every day and I'm pouring my soul out on this character. You know, I'm reading all of the lines, memorizing every single one. I'm trying to perfect my voice and perfect my walk and whatnot. Because I need opening night to be perfect. That's my time to shine. You know, there's rehearsals, rehearsals, rehearsals. We got our final tech rehearsal and whatnot. And opening night comes around and I'm ready. I'm ready for this. And this shows, it's not like your typical play on the, on the stage. Um, like I said earlier, it's an interactive dinner theater murder mystery. Uh, so everybody's in tables and you're just performing around these tables in uh, effectively the high school lunchroom. Um, they're all, you know, there's nice tablecloths. We had, uh, I think, Olive Garden <laughs> come and make the food or something like that. It was pretty, pretty decent. Um, but see, the whole, the whole area is the stage, and you just gotta maneuver around people. And in the intermissions, uh, all the actors come out and improvise and interact with the audience in character with lines that uh, are not pre-written. You know, an audience member might ask a question and you gotta respond in character. Uh, and that's tough. That's a lot scarier than just like going through the motions and delivering lines. Uh, you gotta like be this person and that's, uh, that's kind of hard as an 11th grade kid, uh, but I felt like I was ready. So I'm out on the floor dancing my heart out and singing my heart out and generally acting as hard as I can, and I can feel everybody's eyes on me, you know? And you know what? It feels good. It feels good to be the star of the show. And I felt great all night. It was fantastic. I was a detective. I was out there solving mysteries and shooting guns. Bang, bang. Oh, it was good. People were coming out. They're like, I'm here to double cross you, detective. And I was like, I don't think so, because I'm a man with guns and attitude. That's a good kind of man to be. And that's the man that I was for, you know, maybe like two hours a day, six total days that we run the show. And uh, we had our final song of the final show, final applause and final like handshakes, final family members coming up and giving you a hug, They're like, oh, that was so good. And then, they, then it was over. Then I went back to high school like a normie, like a, like a person with no talent would do. They'd go back to high school and that's what I did. Nobody came, no talent agent came and said, Oh yes, very good. What a good high school show you did. Oh, so proud. So much talent in one small child. Nobody ever said that. I had to learn math. You have no f***ing idea what it's like to learn math when you know you're meant for so much better. Listen to me. I deserve fame, okay? My friend who was in the show with me, uh, me and him had a joke every night before we'd go out uh, and do the show, you know, before opening time. We, we had this thing where we were like, are we famous yet? Are we gonna be famous? And uh, it was a joke, we were like, haha, fun. Eh. Except a, a little bit, 
a little bit I meant it, you know? I was down with the sickness on this fame plan. I was, you know, I was like, am I famous yet? Who knows, maybe. Uh, and then I wasn't. And I'm still not. And I think that's life's greatest injustice. Okay, because I deserve fame. I deserve fame, and you're just here to give it to me. Alright? And if this channel doesn't have a million subscribers by tomorrow, then I quit YouTube, okay? And I'm gonna move to India, where people who deserve fame get what they deserve, I assume. I've never been to India, I didn't learn any things about how famous people are treated in India. Because I had to go to high school and learn about shapes. I could tell you all about a parallelogram. I can't tell you a goddamn thing about Hollywood. You know what? F*** this. You don't understand. F screw this f show. What the f*** ever. Well, now that I've had a moment to calm down, I think that I've come to realize that all that's really important in life is your friends, your family, and how much better than them you are. And another thing. I don't think it matters how cool others think you are. You know, who cares about the opinion of a total stranger when it comes to your value and worth? What really matters is how much cooler than all of them you know you are in your heart. Well, I think that wraps up this episode of Contemplative Coffee Corner. Anyway, here's Wonderwall. Today is gonna be the day that they're gonna throw it back to you. By now, you should have somehow realized what you gotta do. I don't believe that anybody feels the way I do about you now.